From the Apollo Theater in Harlem, New York, it's Notes from America. I'm Kai Wright, and what we just heard is a bit of the song State of Emergency by Moo Moo Fresh, one of my guests for this special Martin Luther King Jr. Day broadcast. Harlem, one more time, say hello. And Mumu Fresh joins our conversation now, though I have to say that your real name is Maimuna Youssef. Yes. Mumu Fresh is your stage name. Right. And it's got a cool origin story. So will you share that with us? My stage name? Yeah. Um, it comes from being on the road with the roots. Mumu is like a pet name, kind of my mother would call me Mumu Sha, Mumu Ye. Um, <clears throat> and when I started touring with the roots, maybe in like 2005, um, Rozelle had left and Scratch had left and so I was you know trying to fill in with my beatbox <laughs> my, my early beatbox skills and uh, I was beatboxing one day and just adding the ad lib and adding to the to the flow of what Black Thought was doing and he just looked back and was like moo moo fresh 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 I was like oh I like that <laughs> that works and it, and it has a meaning in Nigeria right like it, oh my god all over the world moo has different <laughs> Are you sure you want me to tell that story? Well, <laughs> tell, it, tell it in a way that's safe for public radio. It's kind of yes, Mumu has many names in many different countries. Uh, I've traveled. Everywhere I travel, people tell me it has a different name. And in um, Nigeria, it means the fool, right? Stupid. So I was like, well, I'm stupid fresh. I feel like it still works, you know? Uh, yeah, so many, many, many regions, many, many names. <laughs> Indeed. So we just heard a bit of your song, State of Emergency, it's from 2023, and I have to point out some of the lyrics. You write, the world is waking up, no time for the politics, because mm -hmm. we can't lose focus, feeling so hopeless, all that's been broken needs to be fixed, sign of the times, it's coming quick, and we can't wait on the government, this mm -hmm. is a state of emergency. Right. This is a, it's beautiful lyrics. This is a song about climate change, though. It is. Tell me about that. Well, it's something that affects all of us. You know, all of my life, um, climate change has been a kind of niche cause, right? If you have the luxury to worry about climate change, you know, if you're in this crunchy granola gr group and you worry about climate change if you because you have extra time, right? And it has not been something that in, in the black and brown communities that we have taking the lead on as we should as stewards of the earth, right? As indigenous people of the land, as traditionally we have, we, we come from the earth. You know, my family's from Mississippi and anybody who has, I'm sure lots of people in here from New York, I just uh, read Dapper Dan's book and he talks about so many people who settled in Harlem actually came from um, North and South Carolina and they kept their communities you know, very tight knit and they understood how to farm. They understood how to live in balance with nature and not to harm the nature. Um, and that's something that we've lost sight of. We, we, we have lost feeling like the environment is ours, like mother nature is ours and our responsibility, our mother, you know? Um, and it is something that I feel like we need to be in the forefront of making sure that we're preserving this relationship with Mother Earth and caring for her in, in the deep way that I, I believe we were assigned to do. That's right. So that's something you want us all to be more woke about. Um, Absolutely. And uh, one of the things we've asked our audience here is to tell us things they want to be more woke about. They're going to mm -hmm. stand in as our callers uh, in this week's show. So I'm going to get to some of our audience questions and comments. Um, and one of them, Juliet Hooker, uh, we. We got a, a number of questions actually from in our last conversation about the about Israel and Palestine today. Mm -hmm. um, and Rachel asked, "How does MLK's message connect with the ongoing crisis in Palestine and Israel today?" Well, I mean, most clearly, right? We know that he would oppose the war because he was um, oppose. You know, he espoused nonviolence. So I think it's it's pretty clear that he would see war not as the solution to the conflict. To anyone's the, problem. Anyone's problems, and that there need to be um, political and diplomatic solutions to the you know the crisis in in Palestine and, and Israel, and and trying to find a way. I think 
you know, for people to live together in, in the territory that they find themselves sharing. Right. Why do you feel like you have to engage, this is now for, for, for you, Maimuda, why, why do you feel like you have to engage politically in your songs? Um, it, why is that part I of I don't feel work? like I have to. I feel called to. You know, I feel like um, being involved, because people always ask me, how'd you get involved in social justice? I say, well, I was born into it. <laughs> I didn't have a choice, you know? You are. Yeah, and so it's just, I feel it on my heart, you know? I, and I, I write about what I feel spiritually called to, to sing about and to talk about when I moved to things, I, you know? I consult with God, like, is this something you want me to speak on? When should I speak on it? How should I speak on it? Um, so that, that is something that, I, among many other things, I feel strongly about when, during Standing Rock, the resistance at Standing Rock, when we were protesting these pipelines, that was a cause that I really felt strongly about getting the hip hop community involved in, right? Because a lot of people felt like, oh, that's an Indian issue, that's a Native American issue, but water is an everybody issue. And, and we don't have forever to figure this thing out. We do not have forever to figure this thing out. You understand what I'm saying? This is not somewhere far in the future. Maybe we'll let future generations figure it out. Like, we don't have that kind of time. Um, and so I, I wanted people to feel the urgency of it. And if the government isn't doing it, every last one of us can make a choice every single day to protect the environment, to stop using fossil fuels. All of us can, can make that choice and we have the power to push this thing forward even if the big companies don't want it. We have the ability to force their hand to save all of us. We're talking, we've talked about the climate, we've talked about nonviolence and war. Uh, here's a question from Lynn Lee that I think connects some of these ideas. I wish people were more aware of things happening in other countries and understood systems that work abroad, like healthcare. How do we get beyond American exceptionalism and learn mm. from other communities and societies? That's big, that's big. So in our wokeness, how do we think globally? Do you, you, want, to, you want to take that, Juliet? So I think this is a, you know, this is something that is a real problem in the U.S. that because of this narrative of American exceptionalism, everybody is, is so focused on what's happening here, as opposed to thinking, you know, how can the U.S. learn from other places? And I think one way in which we can think about this is, you know, there are all these things that are actually not going well in the United States that are wrong, <laughs> and maybe we have something to learn from other people. Yeah. You want to add to it? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like we need to travel more. You know, I see people make, com you know, make comments about comparing other countries to this country and they haven't traveled anywhere. How would you know? How do you know what's going on, you know? And also seeing ourselves- You cannot be aware if seriously. you literally do not know. And seeing ourselves connected, like everything impacts the other. We're not, you know, some island. Like, I, given, given the conflict, right, I've heard many black people saying, well, why are we worried about what's going on in Palestine? You know, how come we're not worried about what's going on in Congo and in, and in um, Niger and in Nigeria? And we absolutely should be worried about all those things, but those things are connected. The, the more you travel, the smaller the world gets. These things are not isolated. Financially, they're connected. Politically, they're connected. I mean, you see that South Africa is, is leading this charge in this lawsuit. We are connected. We are not, and, and, and we have to see ourselves that way. We cannot keep seeing ourselves as isolated, even by race. You know, we are, to me, we are connected by thought, by intention, by where your heart is, by your morals. That is where we are connected and, and aligned. And, you know, and on this point about where is our attention, I, I really would love, I, we're talking about woke today, but I've always wanted to wage a campaign against the words either or in any right. political conversation right. and get us to use the words both and as often as we can. Yeah. Um, Cheryl asks, how do you make MLK's messages of black liberation and the end of oppression relevant to immigrant communities? This is something mm -hmm. I think both of you would have something to say mm -hmm. about. Juliet, do you wanna chime in? So I think this is um, where your point about thinking in and or is really important, right? So the thinking, you know, there are ways in which this is not simply, um, we need to think about how all our struggles are connected. Mm -hmm. 
thinking about you know things like immigrant detention or the separation of children from their families at the border that this is connected to mass incarceration yeah. it's connected to the way in which we think about policing yeah. you know as a way out of problems as opposed to thinking more creatively about how we um, you know how we might solve certain kinds of problems and also if you think about the rhetoric around you know there's a kind of immigrant invasion and the sense that people are feeling um, uh, being displaced that's mm -hmm. connected also to people who are already here who are also not seen as full citizens right so these things aren't disconnected because they're all part of what do we want the US to look like what do we want it to be like how do we want to to treat its citizens, and what kind of state do we want to have? Do we want to have a state that polices, that, you know, um, that is oppressive, or a state that takes care of people? I think it's aligned with MLK's message, um, in particular because he was trying to get the workers' unions mm -hmm. created, you know, and on, on that level, we are very much in this same economic struggle, right? You see a lot of the tensions have to do with economics, you know, it has to do with people's fear about not having enough, right? And there not being systems in place that make sure that everyone has enough, because there is enough for everyone if it's distributed properly, right? Um, and then I also think there's something to be said about our elected officials, foreign policy, destabilizing governments that make it unsuitable for those individuals to live in their own countries. There's something to be said about that. Alan asks, how do we remember the experiences of people over the age of 60, such as segregation? Mm -hmm. And as somebody who's studied so much of that era, Juliet, I think it's a good question. How do we, in, such, in, a, in, a, in a media and political environment that is mm -hmm. necessarily so future mm -hmm. and youth focused, mm -hmm. how do we remember what we could have learned from folks who actually lived through some of the segregation yeah. that we're talking about? That is a really good question. So I think this question of, of, of memory, of how we remember and what we remember is so central because, you know, even thinking about the civil rights movement and that, that sort of romantic narrative that's become the official memory of it, we misremember so many things and then we also choose to remember some and not others. And so I think going back to those folks and trying to to preserve the memory of that time, but also thinking about how it connects to the present, right? Not to be presentist and to say the only reason to preserve it is because of what we can learn from it, but also to, to think about why it's important to, to, if you look at debates today about, you know, things like teaching the 1619 Project or, you know, how did they teach U.S. history, that having an accurate memory of that history is so central mm -hmm. and teaching it and passing it on is absolutely essential. Maimuna, earlier in the show, we heard your incredible rendition of the Scottsboro Boys Lead Belly song. <laughs> Were you familiar with the song before this? I was not, but and I was also interested that he used the word woke in the track. I was like, wow, they've been saying this since back then. <laughs> But, you, but you, you had just come to him. Tell me, yes. what, what are your reflections on him now that he's come to you? Well, I mean, I love that he was a political activist in making music about such a, what could have been a possibly dangerous topic at that time, you know? Like, that he was really stepping out on faith and, and mm -hmm. singing about things that could have gotten him harmed at that time. He right. was, he was, it was very brave of him to, to do that and to lift up the story of the Scottsboro Boys. That was very courageous. Your rendition was wonderful. Thank you, you. you also have a song called Say My Name that is a yes. tribute to Sandra Bland. Mm -hmm. Sandra Bland was, of course, the 28-year-old black woman who was found hanged in a jail cell in Texas in 2015. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that song? Yeah, so I remember watching on YouTube, I watched her be pulled over and handcuffed and arrested. And, and when we found out that she had been hanged in prison, um, I just remember seeing so many of the comments, just having so little remorse for this woman, you know, saying things like, well, she was probably talking too much. You know, black women are real mouthy. Mm. And um, 
it just vexed my spirit so much that I wanted to I wanted to write a tribute to her so that you could empathize with her humanity that she wasn't just a mouthy black woman who you know asked for it but that you could really really feel her humanity and put yourself in her shoes and like what would you want to have been said about you would you have wanted someone to empathize and see your humanity and and to, to give you a second chance or, or, or first chance or to, to not have seen you as a criminal off, off rip, you know? And, um, and I, I wrote it in um, a doo-wop style, you know, as a tribute, you know, we tribute our ancestors with the doo-wop style. Um, yeah, and it just, was, it just was really important for me to tribute her and I ended up meeting her mom. Mm. Her mom actually, I don't even know how she got my number. She just called me at like five in the morning. Like, are wow. you moving fresh? Wow. And I could tell she was a you know older woman and I was raised right. So I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I'm Sandy's mom. And I just broke out in tears. Oh, you know, man. we just, just, you know, built a very beautiful connection around that. And I told her I would make sure I would always lift her daughter up and tell her story and, and, and embody her humanity, you know? That is a lovely thought for us to close on. We are going to have to leave it there.